I mean, as you say, everyone had to adapt literally overnight. So no one had a chance to prepare um, technologically, emotionally, um, with with what was what they have psychologically with with these changes. Uh, look, I, I think the I think the issue with something like Microsoft Teams is it is very static. Children all around the world are having to go to school via corporate platforms that weren't built for education. But could that be supplemented by something that was built for children and was built for education in a way that's engaging? Today we're talking to one half of the husband and wife team behind a Zoom, Douglas Lloyd. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast with myself, David Savage, where we talk to leaders from across the industry and bring you some news and opinion. Today I'm joined by Amber. How are you? I am all good. How are you? Yeah, all right. Well, it's Thursday afternoon, so that's a that's a positive because um, yeah. it's been quite a long week, to be perfectly honest. It has, hasn't it? But it's really nice, though, because we've had a little bit of sunshine this week, so that has helped. But I think also that's made it go slower because it's nice outdoors, so I'm sort of longing to be outside and not in front of my computer working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm slightly worried that it's lulling us into a false sense of security and come March, we'll suddenly find that it's like minus six again for about two weeks before it's invariably a, eventually kicks into proper spring. Yeah, but I did read online yesterday that yesterday we were actually hotter than Malta. So, I mean, it's not, I mean, by all means, it's not sort of bikini weather, but um, we're going in the right direction. But as you say, it might be, it might all change, but it's looking good for now. So we'll... um take what we can get at this stage <laughs> it says a lot about the british attitude towards weather that we're always comparing where we're hotter than i mean it tells yeah. you that generally speaking we're not better than most places <laughs> no no and we get one fairly hot day and we have to make a point that we're hotter than malta but as you say usually we're, yeah. we're not <laughs> and, and in the summer when we're hotter than barcelona or hotter than athens or whatever we get compared to everything breaks so you know that's good this is the thing. I just feel like we're not built for hot weather, are we, really? And also, whenever we're not it built gets for hot really... weather or or cold weather. For that yeah, well, exactly. Just... That's the thing is, it gets cold and people moan that it's too cold, but then obviously it gets hot and people moan that it's too hot. So it's just no pleasing some people, is there? Anyway, this this is an incredibly British way to start the podcast. We should probably yeah. get on the technology and start, instead of just rambling about the weather. Uh, <laughs> the only good thing I will say this time of year, all the spiders are dead. I had to clear out the shed last weekend. Every single spider. There was, I found about five gigantic spider carcasses. I'm really glad I didn't have to do that in the autumn because it would have been like an episode of arach- or It would have been like arachnophobia. <laughs> oh, God. Do you know the best way to get rid of spiders? You have to put like conkers in the corners of the rooms. Oh, conkers and pine cones. Isn't that like, is that for real? That sounds <laughs> like it's probably an old wives' tale, but um, I've never actually yeah. tried it and tested it, but. Well, there we go. You can give it a go, Dave. Although you've already cleared them all out now, so it's probably... Me it's, and spiders, it's <laughs> like we just... We give each other a little bit of respect. Like I, I give them a bit of space. Hopefully they give me a bit, a bit of space. Don't get in each other's way. Everything's all right. You've got a system that's going. And that's, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, right, technology. Uh, today's guest is Douglas. He's the co-founder, along with his wife Estelle, of Azumi. Uh, was a guest on the show three years ago, as you're about to hear. We'll dive into this interview. When we come back, we'll have some commentary. And then we'll have a little bit of tech news. Today, I'm joined uh, by Douglas, uh, the co-founder of Azumi and a previous guest three years ago. Douglas, you were you were on the podcast. So welcome back. Thanks for giving up some time. Thank you, David. Delighted to be back on. I, I cannot believe it's three years. I'm not sure, um, you know, anyway, well, anyway, where has the time gone? <laughs> we're back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm kind of surprised the podcast has gone on as long as it has. But there we go. Um, I said the same about Zoomy, but the good news is you're around, I'm around, and both businesses are thriving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, if anyone hasn't listened to that show, and we've picked up a number of listeners since then, so let's assume that most haven't. Who are Zoomy? So Azumi is a fun learning platform for uh, for primary school age kids. Um, in fact, when when we first uh, when we first spoke, we were just Azumi, but we now have two brands. We have Azumi, which is our kind of slightly younger brand, and DaVinci, which is our older brand. And whereas when we spoke uh, three years ago, we were a fledgling startup, we now have sixty million families across 90 countries um, tuning into video or games uh, across the world so we've, uh, we've we've moved quite a long way and uh, yeah yeah we're, we're now a truly a global business 
So look, fantastic that the the platform has proved so successful given given what you're providing. And obviously right now, the opportunity to give a fun learning environment online that's safe is going to be something that resonates with a huge amount of parents. Um, over the course of the last year, what do you think it is that you've really had to focus in on that has made Azumi and what you're offering so successful? Well, um, you know, first of all, you know, when when uh, when the pandemic hit and and obviously schools started being shut and then that's been something of a rolling experience, we took the very clear idea that, you know, we wanted to help and therefore we we used our technologies and our channels to make our content free to to huge numbers of people who either can't afford to pay for it or wouldn't have access to it because they're not subscribing to a particular service. Um, and and that that that's been very well received, and and we were delighted to do that. Um, I think where we've been able to to really help out is to give parents and, and children a chance to sort of broaden what they're doing during the school day and not feel that it's just a maths lesson, an English lesson. And this is in no way an attack on the teachers because I mean I I really I worship what the teachers have done. I mean if anyone didn't have respect for teachers before, and I always have everyone should doubly so after what they've had to do and and to adapt in the current uh, in the current environment but trying to give um trying to give parents and kids really really fun content video content and games that that makes them smile but makes them also say at the end of the day to their parents did you know that and uh, i learned this and it not necessarily come just from the school you know the school session on microsoft teams you know that feels good and uh, and that's really the goal. Let's let's make sure they can share one learning outcome at the end of the day that they got from us. As it, look, it, it's a point well made that that teachers are kind of revered, which is a great thing uh, by so many. Again, I mean, lots of my colleagues who have young children have have spoken about how tough homeschooling has been uh and it must it must be hard for the teachers right because they aren't necessarily particularly tech literate people themselves and they are having to deliver through a medium just like everyone else in the working world has had to get used to teams and zoom and whatever else so have teachers um you make a point there that that they have been using these platforms and that you want it to be fun and before we hit record you made a point about learning being active versus learning being passive and is it that the traditional mode of teaching when put on a platform like Teams is a little bit passive and, and there, there could be a lot more interaction and, or a lot more engagement from, from a pupil through, through something that's, that's not quite that rigid? Well, I mean, as you say, everyone had to adapt literally overnight. So no one had a chance to prepare um, technologically, emotionally, um, with with what was what they have psychologically with with these changes. I, look, I, I think the I think the issue with something like Microsoft Teams is it is very static. It it is a it feels very much like a corporate platform, which it was um, and really is. And and you're putting static materials, even if they're well produced, which you then print. And I'm speaking from experience. You know, I have three young kids. And every day we get our activities and we print them out and, and you, know, our, you know, our daughters look through them and complete them. But they themselves say that they're boring. Now, part of the boredom is because they don't have the, the wonderful sort of humor and fun and liveliness of being in a classroom. And you cannot change that and nothing will. And the sooner the kids are back in school, the better. But what is missing from these platforms, I think, or what is missing right now that we're seeing and what we're trying to enhance is – is something that's more interactive and slightly, and I mean this, I use this word dangerously, addictive, where the kids sort of think, oh, I really want to do a bit more of that. And one of the things that we've been pushing very hard when, and sharing with teachers are our games, because, you know, it's quite hard to really push through learning outcomes online. It's even harder. And, you know, whether you're dealing with times table or trying to get children to think logically about certain problems you know we, we, we're big advocates and you'll remember perhaps remember this david from our mm. call three years ago you know we said it's about games games are active they're engaging and kids don't realize they're learning but they're learning a lot really really quickly while they're playing that's something that we feel needs to be embraced more within the curriculum but it's hard you know we're changing the, we, you have to change behaviors 
So look, let's 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 just delve on that uh, or dive down on that a little bit deeper because you you mentioned the slightly dangerous word of addictive uh, gaming. Some people can say you know you, you, that it can be dangerously addictive. Obviously, we don't want kids spending hours and hours and hours and hours glued to a screen. So how, what's the sweet spot? How long do you need uh, a child to be playing a logic game for them to really get benefit from it? Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, as we've always said, and, you know, Estelle and I are, you know, we're clearly technology advocates, but we're also, you know, extremely, uh, you know, firm on the fact that, the you know, the children need to be outdoors as much as possible mm. and doing other activities or puzzles or cards or whatever. This is not just about screens. So I think every parent has a challenge, irrespective of the quality of the content that their kids are consuming, that they need to think, OK, enough is enough. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a maths game or a, or a logic. At a certain point, you know, go and do something else. You know, talk to someone, draw, do something different. Yeah. But um, I, you know, typically it's a bit. If you think of it, it's a bit like musical practice. Often you're in a situation where um, you know, music teachers will say, you know, ten to fifteen minutes a day will have a massive impact on the outcome of your your performance and your playing skills. So if you imagine that a child is playing a particular game, it could be about language, it could be about logic, it could be about, it, who knows about the, you know, the countries, you know, capital cities. If they're playing that 10, 15 minutes a day, that isn't very much. I don't think that's an offensive amount of time for a parent. I don't think parents would rail against that, but you will get outcomes, very, very clear, quick outcomes. Has it been a, a benefit uh, for Azumi, that I, I'll get, I'll get, I'll tell a slight anecdote here. I was on the phone to my sister the other day, and I have a nephew who's two and a half years old, and I called her on on a phone as opposed to a video call. And most of our conversations over the last year have been via Zoom. Um, yeah. And my nephew, my nephew Tom, was was confused because he could hear our voice, but he couldn't see us. Yeah. And he's just used to every single phone call being a video call. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, that's that's a slightly interesting dilemma, dilemma perhaps for parents. But is it also quite useful that that they're having to basically accept that so many so many children are used to screens that they are part of our lives? Well, I think I think I think you touch on a very interesting point, which is that parents no longer have the choice to avoid technology. You know, mm -hmm. you know, prior to prior to COVID, some parents. I'm not entirely sure necessarily how. Um, how true it was always the case but some parents would say you know our kids never use phones they never use tablets and there's no doubt that some parents are, are more pro and some are more against and you know what that's that makes sense every parent takes their parenting differently as they should um and, and we i you know i have no views on that but but what COVID certainly did was it said okay my education experience is now going online and therefore, my child is going to have to be online, however old they are, whether they're, you know, four or five upwards. And therefore, I better, I better embrace it and find out the best way that I, you know, that, that I manage that. And I, I start them off in that. Process. So I think it's forced a lot of parents to engage with technology earlier than they would have wanted to. Um, and they haven't had a choice. And therefore, you know, we've we've tried to help them on that because, you know, we always believe that, you know, this is about if you can start good behaviors early in terms of what you're getting out from that content, the environment you're in and the positive aspect to it. Um, and, and that's not just about the actual fun learning content itself, but also about the safe aspect that everyone knows that what we put on has been you know, only we can upload it, that there is nothing that's going to worry anyone. It's all age appropriate. You know, I think that's something that parents just simply have, have been forced to engage with. Mm. And look, I, I was just quite keen to understand exactly what, what the strategy is for making sure that, that, as you said, you're a global company, you've got customers all over the world. Is, is it that, you, and you've given away some free content, so forgive me if I've, I've missed this in the detail earlier on in the conversation, but are you working with with parents to try and say, here is a platform that can supplement the education that you're getting uh, via the schools? Are you going to schools and saying, look, why don't you suggest to your teachers that, that you say, go and play a maths game for 20 minutes to the to the students instead of sitting in a in a Zoom or, or a Teams uh, session? How, how are you trying to make sure that Azumi is reaching more people and, and, and benefiting them? So, I mean, the, the short answer is all of the above. I, I mean, we, you know, we work, our principal route to, uh, 
to our, you know, to the families is through big global clients like Vodafone, like Telefonica, like PCCW in Hong Kong, Singtel in Singapore, uh, DSTV in South Africa. And what we've done, because we've got much greater capabilities, is say to them, you know, for the next three months, give away as many access as you want. You know, it's up to you. Just give them away. Let people use it. You know, we've got the content. Do it. And so so because they have huge reach, you know, millions and millions of people, that means that, um, you know, they're, they're able to get access you know, very, very quickly because they've just got this huge pipe to millions of customers. And then at the same time, on a more local basis, uh, we've we've gone to schools or more importantly, or organizations that support schools um, and said, this content is free. I'll give you an example. We are, um, one of our, our best known series, Search It Up, is all about digital wellness, digital safety. We, in fact, produ- you know, we, we produced it about four years ago. And, you know, that's freely available on our website. You know, if Search It Up is freely available anywhere in the world. Um, the, the other thing is we're now available in 21 languages. Right. So, so you know, you know, whether you're in Poland or Korea or Hungary or Italy, you can get our content, which again means that um, you've got that rich, you know, experience wherever you are, which, which feels like it's for you. We, we're, not, we're not promoting, if that makes sense, you know, English language content. In Romania, we've got mm. a Romanian specific curriculum that fits with what feels right for, you know, for that country. And what's the, what's the strategy as the world comes out of COVID? I mean, um, obviously, Azumi was born before the pandemic. So uh, you, you had a model and a, and a business plan that kind of worked without the idea of kids being stuck on teams instead of being in the classroom. But has that adapted slightly as, as the pandemic's gone on and you've kind of thought about what might happen when we come out the other side of this? Well, I think the key thing for us is that family, uh, the importance of family to make, as I say, most of our, you know, most of our key partners, as I say, you know, the Vodafones of this world, the Huawei's, the Alcatel's, Samsung is, I think they've really realized how important the family is as, as a, as a proportion of the population, as a consumer in terms of, you know, devices or data or connectivity and i think they've realized that they need to do a better job to look after you know the future of our planet the future of our planet unfortunately is sadly neither you nor me david it's our it's our kids Mm -hmm. and you know you know my you know the future plan i look to my 15 year old my 12 year old my 7 year old they're our future. I'm going to do my best to make sure that I do the best for the planet while I'm working around. But, you know, that's and so I think a lot of these there's an element of understanding of that real importance of getting it right. And and there's been a bit of a wake up call. Family has definitely moved up as a, as a group. For me, it felt a bit like a niche beforehand. I mean, how can a third of the world's population be niche? That's insane. You know, you know, but it's almost like the family audience was sort of niche, which it, which it can't be. And I think all of these players, and that's why you see so much activity in the kids' space overall, because it doesn't matter whether you're Apple or Samsung or Huawei or Vodafone, you've got to get your kids' strategy right, because if you don't, you're not going to have your consumers of the future. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, it's been a real pleasure to catch up with you. It's it's fascinating to hear what's going on at Azumi. It's it's. It's obviously uh, been very successful in the time since since we've been away. So fingers crossed we catch up maybe in three years' time. Uh, well, maybe sooner. I mean, again, thank you again for, for having me. It's it's always a pleasure. I'm sorry I don't get to see you in person. I say this to everyone <laughs> again all the moment. But, um, look, thank you again for having us. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And, um, yeah, well, I, I look forward to you moving from the 400th to the 500th and so uh, episode. Oh, we'll see. Every, every good show has its run. Faulty Towers realised that very early. But thanks for your time, Douglas. Not at all, David. Thanks so much. Douglas makes the point that Teams in particular, but Zoom and all these other platforms, are corporate platforms. And that's a really good point that's that's actually probably not spoken about enough. Like None of these platforms that kids are unfortunately having to spend their entire school days on were built for them. Yeah, I mean... It- it's. I thought that was a really interesting point as well because even when you look at like the 
the home screen or like obviously the team screen it is it does look quite dull really doesn't it and it's something you don't often think about when you're on a, a team's call with work but then obviously if you were to put a child in front of it it is yeah it's, it's not sort of designed for kids obviously is it really and I think no. his his platform is obviously you know that's the target audience it's obviously it's a bit more sort of colorful and, and vibrant and um, and creative so yeah, no, I, I, something like as you say, you don't really think about teams in that way, but it's definitely far more corporate, not designed for kids. Yeah, I mean, look, I think along with a lot of people, I've grown to be really quite fond of teams. I think it it does its job. Um, I, I, you know, obviously have spent many, many, many hours using teams this year and it does it does what it needs to do, but it I use it for fleeting meetings at best, maybe an hour, and then I'm off and I'm doing other bits and pieces. I, I think if I was a child and I wanted to be stimulated by education and I was sat there for how long's a school day? Six hours every single day, I'd find it awful. Yeah, no, I think I would as well. And it also depends what type of learner you are, because I know there's all these, I can't remember exactly all of the names, but there's yeah. loads of different ways in which people learn and sitting in front of a screen just going through you know pretty sort of dull stuff as we've said um yeah i mean you're going to not be sort of massively engaged you're probably going to switch off um yeah i, I don't think i because i don't think i'd have the patience to be honest to sit there for six hours in front of that screen just looking yeah. at that sort of that setup and i think you know, we, we had Kerry from Microsoft on the show a few months ago talking about Teams and she was talking about the wonderful collaboration they got with Headspace and how they were talking about virtual commutes. Like the customer base of Teams, the paying customer base is corporate enterprise business. It's great that where these platforms have given free, you know, and Zoom have, have given free um, access to, to, to schools to make sure that, that kids have some kind of format on which to to learn but again the you know the the emphasis is going to be on making sure that these platforms are built for the the likes of us rather than a 14 year old in a chemistry class mm. yeah no absolutely absolutely i mean i have not actually tried I was going to say, say sorry, have you got any younger children? Or sorry, any obviously you haven't got younger children, younger <laughs> siblings. <laughs> have you got any siblings or anything, anybody who's, who's had to kind of use it from an education point of view? No, I actually don't know. Um, no, I'd be intrigued to sort of know what they think, though. I mean, because you've got um, nephews, haven't you? Have they, have they had to do this? Is it sort of, is that their setup with their school? No, so my nephew's two and a half, but I have got a goddaughter oh, okay. who's 15. <laughs> okay. Is she is she using so, this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Sophia is is pretty constantly on, as far as I, I I've been aware, because because she's she's in France, but it's exactly the same thing. They've been in in virtual learning environments um, for most of the last year. I think they're going back to school next week. I think. Um, okay. I can't imagine. I mean, I, I know I know from talking to uh, their mum Emma. Uh, Tabitha, who's her elder sister, who's 17, has found it really lonely, like mm -hmm. all day on Zoom calls or Teams calls. I'm not sure if it's Zoom or Teams, to be perfectly honest, that they're using. And then no friends, no socialization once it's over, effectively in a room. Um, it's Yeah, you can see how, how where a Zoomie can come in, if they can make it interesting and, you know, in in... 10 or 15 minutes you can get clear outcome actually that's really the va i think that moves up the value chain even because kids are are struggling at the minute with keeping their the enthusiasm up you know we're, we're talking to companies at the minute all the time about how you how do you keep your your work your workers engaged keeping kids engaged through this is going to have been really hard oh yeah massively massively i don't envy anyone that is having to sort of like homeschool at the moment or like hold down a job and, and try to homeschool as well. Like you say, obviously they've been adaptive in the sense that they are using these types of platforms and teachers are able to continue learning through those, which is, um, you know, obviously it, it, it's, it's, it's something, it seems to be doing the job, but like when you're in an office, you sort of live for those moments where you can kind of break off and have that little social interaction. It almost like tops you mm. back up again and then you're happy to go back to work and sort of crack on with what you was doing. Same for kids. They probably live for going out and, and sort of you know having the school break you know or 
walking yeah. between lessons and sort of speaking to one another. Um, and if you haven't got that, it's literally just six hours, as we said before, of sitting in front of a screen and doing the bits that aren't very exciting in the school day. Obviously, the yeah. bits that have to be yeah. done that you're there to learn. But um, but yeah, it's 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 I, I think it's quite intense. Like you said, and I, I would find it quite isolating as well. Um, yeah, you can see why yeah. so many you, you know younger people are struggling with with mental health and, and so on mm-hmm. at the minute. Out of interest, how old were you when your parents allowed you to have a phone? So I think maybe about 10, but it wasn't That's like, quite young. it is. So basically the reason I got the phone, this is crazy. You would never see this happen today. So do you remember those, like the Avon catalog where you used to get put through your door yeah. and you could order like makeup and bits and bobs. So they basically remember, did a Amber, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm getting near 40 now. I'm 36. <laughs> of course I bloody remember. Um, well, they did like a deal where basically if you spent like over £25, you got a free Nokia phone. Really? Um, and I, Yeah, I've no idea why they did it. And we were basically like, oh, amazing. Like, let's do it, obviously. So we did it and I had that phone. But of course, I had absolutely no idea how to use it. No, there was no credit on it. So I couldn't really do anything with it. So I say I got a phone at 10. But I mean, I probably started to actually use one about maybe like 13, 14. It was just kind of like a, a toy more than anything, to be honest, whilst I was 10. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Because even talking to you, you're in your early 20s. Um, but phones when you were, would have been mid-teens would have been the very first versions of smartphones, right? So we're not talking about... We probably forget how far mobile technologies come in just five years mm. in terms of access to the internet multimedia devices uh being able to stream stuff endlessly from just about anywhere um and i, I, I don't envy parents right now and trying to work out uh, you know how much is too much of how much exposure is the right amount of exposure to all of these technologies like i was saying my my nephew tom um really confused by it by a traditional phone call yeah no i i i thought that was crazy but I, I reckon so many kids are the same because it's just what they know isn't it really it's just the way the world is now it's what they're sort of being brought up and, and that's sort of what's going on day to day um and, and also throughout this time if you didn't have a video call you wouldn't see anyone. So, of course, like having a phone conversation is nice. You get to hear their voice. But if you didn't have a video call, you wouldn't see your nan. You wouldn't have seen your nan for like a, a year. You wouldn't have seen yeah. relatives for you know, a year or so. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's like you said, it's strange that obviously that's the way he knows a, like a, a phone call now um, and knows that setup. But it's just the way the world and it's kind of the direction that everything's going. It's all going so digital, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And look, I think it's a really good thing that actually Azumi is being built by uh, two parents who have children squarely in um, the sweet spot for their own product. Yeah, no, definitely. I think if they were not parents and they were trying to like to design this, it would be, I don't know, there's kind of a, there's a gap there, isn't there really? But as their parents, they've got children, they can kind of, I, I guess they, they know what works. Yeah, they probably use them to sort of, to get feedback and stuff, really, don't they? Mm. So it's um yeah, if you were sort of not a parent and you were trying to do this, I don't think you would sort of hit the mark as much as what they have done. And yeah, I, I sort of had a, a quick glance over the website and stuff, and I think um it seems like a really cool platform. There's no need to sort of download tons of apps. It's all sort of all thrown together in one place. Um, mm. And also, I thought as well because if you get like um Sky or you know amazon or um something like that it, it's so like expensive isn't it you know if you want to sort of get like a sky package with the kids stuff in there you're thinking like maybe 25 30 pound a month or so um whereas with these guys obviously it's all just there isn't it like you can put this on with the kids they're learning at the same time yeah i think it's a really cool platform well look, douglas thank you for being our guest again uh and fingers crossed as we said it's not three years until you're back on the show if the show's still going in three years. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, really interesting to hear how the business is getting on. We'll take a quick advert break. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about a business that's just raised $30 million uh, through their use of predictive AI. 
A couple of years ago, Michael and Jacob, two friends from London, were both thinking about their consumption and sustainability as a whole. Michael, a professional footballer at the time, realised he had no options when it came to sustainable sportswear. Overconsumption and underuse was all too common. Hilo was born, a sportswear brand fighting for the planet by changing mindsets. They started with a running shoe made with seven natural materials, and the shoe can be recycled at the end of its life. As a company, they've offset their carbon to beyond zero, making them carbon negative. You can find out more about Hilo and support their mission at hiloathletics.com. That's H-Y-L-O. We support the Hilo movement. Metasafe raises $30 million for predictive AI that reminds people to take their pills. This might sound like the most boring a uh, bit of tech, but I can promise you, as someone who lives in a household where both me and my wife host to take pills, which is tragic at our age, but there we go. Um, <laughs> um, I can actually really see the value of this. And I think what the reason why I wanted to kind of talk about it a little bit is not only is, is it something that uh, I can relate to and I go, oh yeah, it's a, it's a real pain in the ass to keep remembering when you need to take stuff. We habitually forget. Uh, and actually, I hadn't realized that the knock-on effects, and the knock-on effects, by the way, to people forgetting to take tablets or, or a lack of adherence is 125,000 deaths a year. This is in America. Uh, and between 100 billion and $289 billion a year cost on the healthcare system. So there's a good reason for this company to exist and to raise some money. But equally, we talk about AI and we all get very excited about what AI may or may not be and what it may or may not do. And actually, here's an example of a machine learning algorithm just doing something really simple that helps people manage their lives a little bit better. Hmm, I, but I see that the thing is, I find that you could just put like an alarm on your phone. Like maybe that's a really simple way of looking at it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's... um. I'm not sure if I'm bought into this one, to be honest. I mean, I don't have to take any tablets sort of day to day. So maybe it's um, sort of slightly naive of me to say that. You could just pop an alarm on your phone. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I'm sort of massively sold on this one. Don't, don't, bear with me because as someone who's had to take tablets, you can you can forget. So after a patient enters a medication the, into the MetaSafe smartphone app, the app guides them through a process that entails collect, uh, collecting release forms and helping them through um, their schedules. It's powered by their AI engine just in time in interventions. Um, so the app's content changes as a patient um, matriculates through the therapy and recovery, delivering instructions on how to administer medication, uh, assessing eligibility for financial support programs, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing I would say about your argument around why not just set an alarm, right, is you could have about five different alarms going and get thoroughly confused because most people who are taking one tablet probably aren't taking one tablet. They might be taking like three or four different types of medication at different times of day and have various different prescriptions running out at various different times. Yeah, that is a good point. And also when you read off the stuff off of their like their website i'm assuming it actually sounds a way more technical than just popping an alarm <laughs> on your phone so it seems like they do quite a bit more than 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 that really but um yeah i understand what you're saying if you've got like loads of tablets to take that's probably a good way of sort of monitoring it and oh christ i mean my, sure my mum is on a cocktail my mum is on an absolute <laughs> cocktail of tablets it's ridiculous um but I can relate to it because at one point last year I was taking nine tablets a day and it's like, hang on a minute, what have I taken? What haven't I taken? Have I taken that? I don't know. Um, oh, gosh, yeah. So, yeah, this is something that I was like, I'm on board with it. But you being a bit questioning shows <laughs> – actually, no, this is, this is good because it shows what the general population is kind of like, really, do we need that? Uh, maybe we should get MetaSafe on the show and and get them to, to lay out their case. Yeah, they can argue back. Um I don't know because also as well you can get this is this is really a, a simple way of looking at it but you can get like the um the boxes can't you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I had, little, they're little they're still like because then you got yeah they they're still a bit of a pain in the ass. I'll be honest. Yeah, no, I mean, maybe I'm just trying to sort of battle against it, but um yeah, initial thoughts wasn't completely sold. I think there's more to it than than what I first thought by the sounds of things. Um, but as I say, obviously, for somebody who doesn't take sort of tons of tablets a day, that's probably why I'm not sort of massively. Come on, um, have something going wrong I'm, with you. Come yeah, on. You're gonna fall apart. <laughs> uh, just too young and healthy. God, uh, <laughs> we should get MetaSafe on the show. Get them to to, to argue their cases to someone young and healthy, uh, and then you'll then that, that that'll be the the way of making sure that if they can if they can articulate it to you, then it's a winner. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. 
it's the, it's the end of the week as people are listening to this it's probably friday have a lovely weekend hopefully if you wherever you are the nice weather holds if you're listening in the states hopefully uh the snowstorm has passed over and and you're not yeah because that's been fairly horrific over there if you're in the uk i think it's going to be sunny so enjoy that <laughs>